beginning uh, my talk with asking Open Allah, up. and that is, I recommend that each one of you, irrespective of what stage in life you may be, how whatever your age may be, to start writing your obituary. I did that. And I think that's what changed my life, is writing one's own obituary. You know, um, when you're um, in my high of my corporate life, I've been in the corporate world for 26 years. I, I was one of those very few women uh, CEOs in the country. Business India, business world said I was one of the highest earning, um, you know, I, I, had, I earned the highest salary amongst women CEOs. I don't know whether that is true, but I do know that yes, I earned a handsome amount. And uh, it is at that point in time when I got a lot of awards uh, in the corporate world from CII and Siki and the rest that I actually started reading obituaries. Um, from the economists, I like obituaries written in the economists because they don't write only about politicians or industrialists, they write about unknown people um, working in the grassroots, doing interesting things, but the world does not know them. And they pick up salient points of why they write about these people, it's because they, in their own way, have made a difference. I began to make uh, you know, uh, analysis of my life uh, when I was in the prime of corporate career and said, Yes, I've won this award and, you know, I've become women, you know, the women of the year and a various labels. But have I made any difference in this life? That really hit me hard. And I realized that, yes, I had made my organization profitable. I had hired, um, given employment to a lot of people. I had also looked at uh, you know bringing in the gender equity and you know hired a lot of women giving them opportunities but had I really made any meaningful difference in people's lives when I thought through I realized that I needed to make a change and I looked around and I found the inequity was absolutely horrendous around me I know Stasia in her eloquent speech said that when she had the opportunity to be an anchor, she didn't want to cover uh, lifestyle, she didn't want to cover just education, she wanted to cover uh, a larger gambit. Today I'm going to cover just education. Because I think just education is the framework and foundation of who we are, of how we shape our country, of what we talk about, and what issues of the world are. And when I talk about just education, I'm not going to be talking about just India. I'm not going to be talking about just Bangalore or just uh, Karnataka. I'm going to be talking about the crippled developing countries. Uh, countries that uh, have actually such, such human resource potential but not being able to see the light of day purely because we have not paid enough education, enough attention to that education. Look at what it is that the statistics are absolutely um, mind-boggling. There's total number of school-aged children in India is 195 million, Pakistan 29 million, Bangladesh 26 million, Nepal 5.6 million. Total number of children out of school in India is 12 million. Pakistan 9.4 million. Bangladesh 5.6 million. Nepal 2 million. And the percentage of school dropouts in India is 52%. Pakistan 48%. Bangladesh 6%. Nepal 5%. And 50% of all dropouts necessarily are girls in all these Story that is absolutely heart wrenching. But let's 
let's look at Bangalore, which is the IT capital of the country, the Silicon Valley, so to say. I met a few of your students are going to go all the way to do internship in Bangalore in IT uh, companies. So it seems to be a happy city. And yet, there are 850 slums in Bangalore. 2.5 million people live in these slums. And uh, they are hidden, hidden from all these, uh, you know, IT campuses. And if you if you go to some of these technology parks uh, in Bangalore, let me tell you, they are not any way different from Sunnyvale or Colorado or to, of the Bay Area. And yet, what a difference it is! And it's only when you go deep into it that you realize that. Only we did a dipstick study of the 3,000 IT companies that are in Bangalore, and we found only 6% of employees had come from government schools. The rest of them are privileged people who have had access to privileged education and and have had the opportunity that some of them have got. So we needed to do something about it, and. We need to make sure that, you know, in our country, we need to get our children to be able to earn well. 79% of the population in India, uh, um, you may know, earn less than 50 rupees a day. 60% in Pakistan, 81% in Bangladesh, and 60% in Nepal. This has great impact to the access to education, quality education that these children have from these homes. And all of this is because of a lack of pragmatic vision, misuse of funds, uh, rampant corruption, political instability, outdated curriculum, and lack of quality teachers. This problem is standard in all the there is ratios could be relatively different, but the problem is equal. And it's these, you know, these kind of figures that I've been rattling her out are very overwhelming. They can be very intimidating. And when you want to do something good, you get struck by your own inadequacy. How can I, as a single person, make any difference? The problem is so big. So many of us take to discussing the situation of the country and the education system in, uh, you know, uh, coffee tables, uh, over a drink at the bar, and, and not much about it. I also could have Many years of my life, I only discussed what the problems were and expected the government to do something about it. One day, I decided, and that day, when I really paid attention to reading an obituary, that I decided that I needed to do something about it. So I quit my book. And please, I want to make one thing very clear. When I talk to you about my journey, the risk of these TEDxes and TED uh, conferences is people like us stand over here and we talk to you and spout about our successes. Please, you all must understand there are many things that we do wrong. There are many things that uh, haven't worked, but we don't get the opportunity to share that. You need to distill what we say and do a critical analysis that institutes like this uh, are famous for and take only what is applicable to So I begin with great amount of humility to share with you some of the things that seem to have worked in, in my life, in my organization. And it worked because, again, with great amount of humility, I got, uh, you know, interned with someone like Mother Teresa who uh, taught me uh, when I was doing my school college and my business management, 
taught me that uh, the best way to do work uh, is never ever to think that you're doing a good job. It's to always think that very simple people can do great things if they do it with great amount of passion and love. I got interned in that and, and that's why I have kept a few things that she would tell us as when we were volunteering. And I volunteered with her for seven years in Calcutta. And I and she said that one of the most important, you know, she had this thing of telling stories and said her magic seeds, you know, the African seed. She would say, You need to have some clarity, you need to have conviction, you believe you make this another seed. You need to be able to communicate that very well. And you need to have a great amount of courage because uh, you know uh, people will be there to oppose you. But most of all, you need to have compassion. And one of the things that I've learned myself over the years, that in forums such as this, we talk great deal about passion. But imagine passion is embedded. Passion, without compassion, is of really no use. And compassion can't do much without passion. So, this is, and she would tell me, uh, as an individual, she would say, you know, I see a great amount of energy in you, and uh, I know you're young, and you have a great amount of dreams, but the way to make the dreams become a reality is to uh, have her famous piece, the Alphabet Queen, she would say, you need to have passion, perseverance, and patience. And I have learned that in my 15 years of doing social work. We often don't have enough patience. When we are doing this kind of work, we are really doing, in many ways, social re-engineering, which requires great amount of perseverance and, and patience because it be generations and generations to make a change and yet you have to be doing it every day. So um, I quit my corporate life and literally literally started Parikrama from the kitchen table with my entire life savings um, that had kept aside for old age and that's Closer and uh, my daughter's age. Uh, I decided that old age will take care of itself and my daughter has to take care of herself. And so, with all that I had saved, years of um, leadership roles, I put into Parikrama because it was important not to go to anyone else to ask for funds till I had taken risks and it. So the first thing that I did was walk through the slums. And that's when I realized there were 850 slums in, in Bangalore. I couldn't manage to cover all 850 slums, but I definitely covered about um, 320 slums. And we started a program where we looked at the 360 degree model, where we teach or we give our children all three meals. This is non-residential, all three meals total health care, as well as um, um, you know, family care, 98% of our fathers are alcoholics, 98% of our children have someone in their family in jail, we're working with this group, the average income is about 2,500 rupees per month, five people to feed, so we're basically talking about dysfunctional homes, and we take care of our children from age 5 to uh, 25, we have, I have now four schools, um, one college, a teacher training center, an orphanage for uh, girls at risk, and 1,700 children, uh, and um, 204 children, students that are in college. I have several doing engineering. I have a student, two students at National Law School. I have a software engineer at Cisco. I have a software engineer at IB. Many software, but the software is growing in Parikrama. And I have uh, the doctors, 
nurses, about to be lawyers, uh, all first generation learners. Nobody in their family has ever been to school. Forget about college. And they are, they are coming up with great dreams and possibilities. I tell them dreams are important, but it's very important to be grounded. I tell them it is important to have a wishbone. It's very important to have a backbone. Without a backbone, wishbone can only stay in wishes. And that's what I'm trying to do in the Parikrama schools. It's very important for us to look at education as not just creating competencies, not just getting ready for getting jobs, but creating capabilities, capabilities of living together, capabilities of having patience, capabilities of loving. You know, love can be taught. Uh, kindness can be taught. We have moved away from that. We think it's inherent and we take it for granted or we have moral sense classes. But to create children in an environment of empathy, compassion and kindness is extremely important. And that's what we are trying to do today. And that is what I have learned in the last uh, 15 years of doing this kind of work. Um, I know that you have uh, often in uh, forums like this, you hear great people speak, you hear their talks, and you may have heard Steve Jobs saying that your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe in as his great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what I have heard that often. Have you heard uh, what he wrote, what Steve Jobs wrote uh, on his deathbed? He wrote, I reach the pinnacle of success in the business world. In others' eyes, my life is an epitome of success. However, aside from work, I have little joy in I have little joy. In the end, Wealth is only a fact of life that I am accustomed to. At this moment, lying on the sick bed, recalling my whole life, I realized that all the recognition and wealth that I took so much pride in had failed and become meaningless in the face of impending death. Now I know we should pursue other matters that are unrelated to wealth. There should be something that should be more. I leave that those words with you. I leave you with the idea that the reality check comes in when you start writing your material. Let me share with you my children from